Well, welcome to the uh, audit committee meeting for the town of Cave Creek, Arizona. It is Monday, August 19th. We are joined by uh, by Brian Hemmerly. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of council, can you all hear me just fine? Yeah, we can. So Perfect. We, we're now in order. I have a silent roll call. I guess it's not silent if I ask you about it, but um, I think we'll hold the Pledge of Allegiance for the next meeting. Uh, the presentation will be the audit committee members' discussion with the town auditors regarding the upcoming town's comprehensive annual financial report process for fiscal year 2023 to 2024 audit as required by resolution R2023-08 that established the audit committee and duties and responsibilities of the committee. And um, this is presented today by the uh, town auditor. Brian, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a brief presentation. I'm going to pull this up for you. Uh, let me know. Uh, can you all see that just fine? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Okay, again, my name is Brian Hemmerly. I'm the lead audit partner for the Town of Cave Creek's external audit this year, uh, the June 30, 2024 fiscal year and audit. I've got a brief presentation for you all. Uh, there are some requirements each year for uh, audit, external audits uh, in accordance with government accounting standards, um, generally accepted auditing standards, uh, as well as state statute. Uh, your audit team before you here is a brief picture of the manager, the partner, and the uh, senior on the audit. Uh, same people that we usually have out uh, in the past few years now, so they are familiar with some of the uh, town-specific items uh, in the financial statements, which does help when, when making sure we're getting some of the details of the audit. Um, again, this audit is required by state statute, so it is your external audit of the financial statements for the town of Cave Creek. We do a presentation at the beginning of the audit, just like this the one we're doing right now, uh, and then we do a final presentation at the end when we have issued our report and our findings, if any findings, um, and uh, the financial statements. We will have three de deliverables. The first one is, of course, your financial statements. Uh, in the financial statements, we will give you our uh, generally accepted uh, accounting principles uh, for the financial statements, and we'll make sure that you understand that these statements are fairly materially stated within a reasonable uh, assurance. The second deliverable is related to what we call our yellow book report. This is for compliance purposes. So the state also requires that you are audited for compliance with things like laws, regulations, grants, contracts, debt covenants, things of that nature. So we do review um, samples of all those types of items to make sure we don't detect any non-compliance with any of those items. The third item this year is related to your COVID spending for your um, ARPA money, the uh, American Recovery Program. And that money will have uh, a special audit of just how that was spent, and that will obtain its own report. So we'll have a third report that we will then upload to the federal government with the help of Sherry White, your finance director, uh, and make sure that the federal government and the United States Treasury has um, access to our report on how you spent your COVID-19 money in the, in the past year for up through June 30, 2024. Any findings that we have throughout the audit will be reported to all of you town council, uh, whether it's a material weakness, a significant deficiency, or even just a management letter comment, we will report that out to you to make sure you're aware of anything we find. Of course, if we find anything bigger than that, such as fraud, waste, abuse, um, anything that uh, might have more of a legal impl implication, we will um, report that as soon as we uh, have discovered it, if discovered. A couple other things we want to mention is we do provide a letter to council as part of our deliverables, so that will be provided to you at the end of the audit to just discuss what we did, processes and procedures. Again, we will have the ARPA COVID-19 funding audit. We also look at the expenditure limitation report. This is required by state uh, statute that we look at the expenditures of the town, make sure they're under the limitation that's required by state statute in your annual expenditure limitation report, what we call the ELR. Uh, some non-audit services that we perform, we do help prepare the financial statements each year. We will help in providing what's called the data collection form for the single audit if necessary each year. Uh, that gets That single audit is your federal funding audit that gets uploaded to the federal government. And then again, any proposing or correcting journal entries, we will tell you about all correcting journal entries. Um, if any. The timeline for the audit, we did go out in early June. I'm sorry, mid-June, I believe it was mid-June, late June. Uh, we did some prelim work. We started testing some internal controls. We started our federal 
uh, single audit, the audit with the federal money for the COVID money. We started that process. We're in the process of finishing that up right now. We have this meeting in August, and then we'll come out in September, October timeframe for a full week, and we will do a deep dive on uh, all the financial statement activity. We do sample planning um, as far as uh, statistically valid sampling, test controls, uh, and then, of course, we'll draft your reports in November, December, and our hope is that we can pr present to all of you in December of 2024 the results of that audit. For our audit planning considerations, we do use a risk-based approach as required by auditing standards. Uh, we do test the uh, effectiveness of internal controls, different controls each year. Uh, we don't necessarily provide an opinion on those controls, but if we do find anything while testing internal controls, we will report that out to you, whether it's you know, a very small trivial amount might be in the management letter comment to uh, correct something or maybe just improve a few things, or if it's a material thing that we find that we will, of course, report that as a material weakness to governance, to the council. Uh, yes. And then, of course, yes, sir. Um, we do not express an opinion on effectiveness of internal controls. What, what are you auditing if you don't have an opinion on the effectiveness? Uh, we provide an opinion that the financial statements are um, uh, materially correct within a reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. So by doing that, we are actually, most of the work we do is testing detailed transactions using st statistically valid sampling. And we determine our sampling based on the risk-based approach, whether your internal controls are uh, op not operating effectively all the time, but most of the time, what we'll do is we'll look at the design and implementation of your internal controls. And then of course, any high-risk internal controls, we will test them to see if they're effective. Uh, what what I mentioned earlier is if we find something that is ineffective during the course of our audit, we'll report that out to you. But we don't express a specific opinion on all the effectiveness of your internal controls. We What we do specifically is make sure your financial statements are materially correct. Does that help with that answer, Mr. Mayor? Uh, kind of, yeah. Okay. okay. And I'd be happy to take, um, you know, I was going to mention this at the end, but I'd be happy to to have a more in-depth conversation with any one of the council members. Um, I'd love to talk to any of you if you have any concerns. Uh, just the last few things here, we do have a consideration of fraud. If you're aware of any fraud, allegations of fraud, or you suspect any fraud, um, I'd ask that you please reach out to me. Both Teresa and Sherry have my email and my phone number. Uh, you can request that directly from them, and then you can reach out to me, or um, I can email uh, the mayor and make sure that you guys are aware of my information that way as well. And I believe we've talked before, the mayor and I. Um, so that is a required communication with us. And then again, with the ARPA funding, we will test that. But really the most important part of this presentation, what I wanna to get to at the very end here is, um, I'd be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with any one of the members of the council, the mayor. Uh, to right. Yep. <laughs> so, Sorry, Councillor Rhodes would like you to go back. So if you go back to the mayor's question, let me see if I kind of understand what you're saying. Let's say we have 120 different controls. You're going to statistically sample a bunch of them to see how to see if they're if they're um, in place and you can do something with them, right? You're not going to exit 120. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, we will test a sample of your controls. And if we find anything and usually if we do it's it's usually not a very material but if even if it's immaterial to the audit we will at least make a recommendation to improve the control um, if it's material to the audit then we have to report it as either significant deficiency or material weakness within our audit report which we would have uh in the audit reports that we'll issue at the end of the audit so yes I want to just say that you're sampling a no, it, where you say approach to internal control. <clears throat> we do not express an opinion on effectiveness. You're not sampling all of them. So you might want to put something saying we, we sample a or we take a statistically valid sample to test effectivity. Okay. Yep. Duly noted. Thank you. Uh, Brian, uh, the second part of that, I, I, I think that um, if, if you would s send an email to the town manager who can forward it, with sure. their contact. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor, we will, we will do that. Members of council, um, I'll make sure that both Sherry and town manager has my information. I believe they have it currently, but I'll, I'll double check with them and I'll send them an email right after this meeting. Um, yeah, and again, receive it. I'm sorry, I interrupted, what was that? Uh, Brian, just said that uh, we, Sherry and I'd be happy to forward that on to the mayor and council. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. So that, that's my required communication for the beginning of the audit process. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have, um, or if you'd prefer, um, sometimes it's better just to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If there's any specific areas of the audit that you'd like us to focus on this year, uh, maybe you have concerns with, that always helps us with planning the audit as well. So um, you can reach out to town, the town manager or Sherry, and they can get you my information, and we can set up a phone call and have a chat. Mayor, may I step in here just for a minute? Hey, Paul, and welcome. And thank you. Um, so, Brian, um, maybe this is too specific, but we have uh, made a big effort um, in the past year to um, really be inclusive to community groups. And so we've got civic money now out in the, in the hands of uh, just our, our public volunteers. And um, it's a it's a great thing that we've done. We've got the rodeo. We have a landmarks program with the museum, and we had a wonderful grants program. And I'm wondering um, how you track the the use of those funds. Uh, and maybe maybe we're getting too fine a grain here, but I don't really think so. People want to know where their money's going. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, Member Elka. Oh, come on. I hope I think I'm saying that right. You're um, doing yeah, <laughs> uh, we will absolutely. I can. I will make sure to take note of what your all the programs you just mentioned there. And what we'll do is we will uh, look into how they're being recorded and reported, and make sure that the controls and the operations and the um, the actual uh, recording and spending of that money is is in line with with how. It, it could be reported on the financial statements. And then when we come back out in December, I can give you more specific answers to uh, what we found in that area, if you'd like. Great. If I may jump in, uh, regarding the grants programs, uh, each of the organization that's receiving funding from the town is required to write a report um, at the end of their year that they receive the money. Uh, and explaining how that money was used, especially if it was any differently than how it was originally requested. So there is a process in place uh, that will acknowledge how that money is being spent. If I could also just add, I believe what Brian was meaning is that they would look at how those are recorded in the town's financial statements, not looking at those organizations' records. Right. I think Paul's question was about it, how exactly. we're tracking how those funds are being spent, which is a valid question. Okay. But in the town's financial state process in place. Yes. If it's auditing those organizations, that's not part of no, the agreement. No, I don't think, Paul, you were. No, I wasn't. That. No. Thank you for the okay, question. Other... Hey, Brian, anything else that uh, you have for us? Uh, not today. No. Um, Again, I, I'd love to talk to any of you if you're interested, um, and you can get that information from the town manager. Okay, uh, seeing no further business here then, this portion of the audit committee meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thirty meeting. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Bye. So we... Um, are you still recording? Okay, well, we'll, we'll take a 10-minute a, uh, break then and be back at uh, 4.30, and then we will immediately adjourn into the executive session in the other room. First item on the agenda is the uh, council discussion, consultation, direction to, and legal advice from the town attorney pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 and 4 regarding Arizona State Land Agreement. Number two is council discussion, consultation, direction to, and legal advice from the town attorney pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 and 4 regarding Continental Mountain Estates Agreement. Is there a motion to move into executive session? All those in favor? Opposed? Aye. We're now in executive session across the way. Welcome to the regular portion of the town council meeting. Uh, we just completed the executive session. We're now on the Pledge of Allegiance. And Bob Anderson, would you lead us in the pledge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public announcements. Um, I have none. Council? Hot. <laughs> it's hot. Yeah. Summer is too long. Yeah. And Paul Elkham is, is with us uh, digitally and verbally, I think. Is he still online? He's what? He's not connected. Oh, he's not connected. Okay. He may join us. Yeah. Uh, we are now at uh, Call the Public then. I have no one wishing to speak. Okay. Town manager report. Mayor Council, um, my report tonight was originally about the um, traffic plan for Cave Creek Road due to the Phoenix Interconnect, um, but I thought it was better to have that actually uh, scheduled, um, so that will be a presentation later. So I just want to make you aware of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, on the consent agenda is number one is council approval, uh, acceptance of an easement dedication from George Picatori for a non-motorized trail pathway easement on parcel APN 216-07-002B, located at 6820 East Cave Creek Road, Cave Creek, Arizona, known as Art in Stone, LLC. Number two is a contract approval to enter into a contract with Howard Auditing Group, LLC, for sales tax auditing services for fiscal year 2024 through 2025, uh, uh, fiscal year 2024-25 through fiscal year 2026-27 for an amount up to $24,000 per year. Approval of the March 4th, 2024 regular council meeting minutes. Approval of the March 25th, 2024 regular council meeting minutes. And approval of the April 1, 2024 regular council meeting minutes. So does anyone want any of these things uh, discussed by, by council? Okay, then uh, looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion passes. Did you say aye, Paul? Paul, Paul can you hear me? Paul Elkema? Okay. Paul, you're in 6-0. <laughs> I'm on. Okay, welcome. Okay. You already missed one vote. We're going to dock your pay. <laughs> All right. Consent agenda. Um, general agenda items. Uh, Mayor, if I can just bring to your attention, uh, we skipped over the presentation that the town engineer is going to make. Oh, I thought it, I thought you said it was going to be. Um, no, I said I was going to be under my town report, but I actually agenda sized it so he can do this tonight. Well, bring him up. I'm very happy with him right now. Okay. <laughs> he did. He got. Some... You may not like what he has to say. But he got, uh, some, he got some chip sealing done with a very innovative way. So I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> Mayor. It was a a bypass that needed to be done. Um, okay. As as you probably all realize, Mayor and Council, that City of Phoenix is putting in a little has a little project coming up Cape Creek Road, and it keeps getting closer and closer to us. Uh, so uh, what we did is we went ahead and we've been working uh, with Garney and Wilson engineers who are the construction managers for the city of Phoenix and uh, NBC uh, has National Barricade Company has been preparing the traffic control plans for them. Uh, the project has a PR firm with a hotline established and uh, we put out on our website that PR hotline number. So if there are any issues, uh, they can reach out. Uh, the hotline number is 602-532-6222. So if anyone has any issues that they wish to discuss with them, it's not a town of Cape Creek project, it's a city of Phoenix project. But we are working with the closely with the contractor and the traffic control uh, plans as the project progresses towards the intersection of Cape Creek Road and Carefree Highway. Uh, I hate to report, but the traffic situation most likely will get worse uh, due to the work that must occur um, and, and the tie-ins that must be made crossing Cape Creek Road. 
and Carefree Highway. The traffic restrictions will be in place until around mid-December. So if you saw my uh, traffic plan that I put out for this meeting, uh, you'll see that it was in green and red in celebration of the holidays. Actually, green was go and red was stop is what I was going for. But when I heard it was going to be through mid-December, I decided that it sort of fit that anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so it is our duty to, as the town representatives to look out the best interests of Cape Creek and its businesses during the process. I will say one such requirement was uh, to main traffic to the Walmart, Burger King, uh, Firehouse Subs, et cetera, for southbound uh, our southbound traffic, which is most of our residents on Cape Creek Road, even though the left-hand turn bay at Olson um, needed to close. Uh, again, with them directing all the traffic, there's no way you wanted people to veer off trying to get over the left turn bay through oncoming traffic. As is, we've already had two uh, head-on collisions at that intersection, uh, despite having it being a signalized intersection and an officer, um, a required officer there from the city of Phoenix during uh, peak times. So in working with our partners at the city of Phoenix, Wilson and Garney, we were able to devise a detour that would allow the use of Barbie, 53rd Street and Olson to direct traffic uh, to those businesses. As part of this detour, it was deemed advisable for the city of Phoenix contractor to chip seal 53rd Street in order to avoid dust issues that would accompany the increase in traffic. Other dust abatement methods were reviewed and deemed more uh, manpower intensive costly than the application of chip seal. The town's public works staff assisted the city of Phoenix contractor by grading 53rd Street in preparation for the chip seal um, coating to be placed. I'd like to thank Tyler Thurman and our public works crew for being able to get our blade out there and get it all smoothed out so that they could lay a nice even surface. Uh, a little um, a letter of the project, a letter of the detour was prepared and uh, Marshall Stein hand delivered it to each one of the businesses. And we also put it on our website so that they could notify. And the letter uh, is in your packet that we put out to the um, put out to the businesses. Uh, the next scheduled change in traffic control will occur in mid-September. Uh, we are working with the contractor to review the traffic control plans in an expeditious manner as they are made available. The one for September, we only have a draft of, and uh, they are definitely subject to change. As uh, So I, even though I have a preliminary copy, it's not something that we need to um, put out because it may change three times before it makes it out. With that, I'll answer any questions you might have and that, that I might be able to answer or ask questions of the contractor. I have a question. Uh, so we're rerouting traffic into area 18. Is that correct? Correct. And have we had any feedback from the residents there? None that we've been notified of. The only one that we were notified of was a, a on the hotline was a call that came in from uh, one of our um, one of our businesses in the tractor supply area that was a uh, concern that people would not be able to get to their business. Um, but uh, again, we've checked with them and um, and also coordinated with Wilson to make sure that there was no deviation. They wanted actually what they were requesting was that where the current uh, left turn bay is, which goes in behind the Chevron gas station, that we put up signs that would route it through the private property, which is something that we can't do. How long will this detour last? Well, hopefully it's going to last the duration, but it will go away when we have the, uh, when they have to switch the sides of the street for the traffic control plan sometime in probably late October, early November. So I guess my only comment would be to be sensitive to the community who lives back there. If they have concerns about excess speed, do we have any speed tables back there that is counting? 
no, we we don't. You mean a traffic counter? We yeah. have not put up one. Uh, the only, um, well, the only there's only one city resident or town resident there. Uh, the other ones are um, after that. It's county because the one part there are two parcels uh, that are on the uh, west side of Fifty uh, Third Street, and one of them is unoccupied, which used to be Fort Grizzly. Okay. So that one is not, that one I doubt we'll have any complaints from because um, we've been trying to get people out of there, not into there. And then there's only one other uh, occupied parcel in the town. There are two south, there are two parcels south of 53rd, but the traffic's not going in front of them. It's turning left on Olison so that it can make its way uh, eastbound through the light. So we figured that it was the best option available to detour traffic. Vice Mayor, if I may, uh, Mayor and Council, Vice Mayor, um, the, the one resident that Al um, identified, um, we did send a notification through email to him. Um, he has had some concerns in the past about the tractor supply and the impacts of, of both noise and exhaust fumes and such. So we made a point of making sure he was aware, um, even reached out to him to see if he wanted, he requested a meeting with me. I gave him some meeting dates um, to talk about this and some other issues he's been experiencing. We have not been able to um, agree to a, a day and time, but uh, we have done some extra reaching out Very good. to people. Thanks, Green. Any other questions? Just a, a comment that you... You know, you want you train the people to use that bypass um, and the, the the existing, what, 52nd Street bypass? 53rd. 53rd. Well, there's another one. I mean, they're using, uh, uh, there's two streets there, at least two, where you can uh, bypass the light at Cave Creek Road and Carefree Highway. Yes. Uh, You're going to have neighborhood complaints in that general area. I hope we're getting ready to deal with how we're going to control all that traffic that will be rerouted on those residential streets. That will be an issue that we're going to be working with the uh, traffic control plan on because we don't want an unintended consequence of 53rd, of uh, 52nd Street, where the residents are. If they go down 53rd, that's fine um, because then they're going by the hospital, Sprouts, tractor supply, and really only one other business. 52nd Street becomes more problematic, and so we are working uh, to try and see how we can um, avoid that. That may be some local um, local business only si or local traffic only signs that may be put up at that time, um, and this would be when the intersection of uh, Cave Creek Road and Carefree Highway um, might become um, a little more backed up. Right now, it seems to be restricted only to uh, Carefree Highway or Cave Creek Road and not Carefree Highway at this point. Anything else from Council? Mayor, I just wanted to let you know, we'll continue. If, if there if there is uh, any issues or this evolves into you know something worse or we start getting a lot more complaints, we'll not only communicate with you and let you know, but we'll continue to do these updates. Um, also, you know, such tools as our um, our newsletter that we put out, the community newsletter, um, this would obviously be a, a great topic for it. Also, we did find out that the um, City of Phoenix contractor does have a PR firm that they utilize, um, and there's the phone number that we're making available to them as well if they wish to report uh, issues with about the contractor or the issues that they observe or um, experience as well. So in addition to us and our resources, uh, there's a public relations firm that is under contract with the city of Phoenix as part of the, um, as part of this project. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is council discussion approval of resolution R 2024-11 setting forth the official returns and approving the official canvas of the primary election held on July 30th 2024, presented by the Deputy Town Manager slash Town Clerk. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Before for you is a request to canvas. Yeah, move your mic down. Oh, 
Before you use a request to canvas the primary July 30th, can you still hear me? You're not here. No, is, is your mic on? There you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good evening, <laughs> Council. <laughs> Before you, as a request to canvas the July 30th, 2024 election by resolution R2024 11, uh, Maricop the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors actually canvassed the election on Monday, August 12th. The seats for mayor and council were successfully filled by the majority vote uh, at the primary election. So we will not have a runoff election um, in November. And all the details are in the packet as far as the election numbers. The successful candidate for mayor is uh, Bob Morris. Congratulations. And for council, Tom Arterton, Cynthia Driscoll, Joe Friedman, Thomas McGuire, Dusty Rhodes, and Catherine Royer. Mayor and council members will be sworn in at the council meeting on Monday, December 2nd of this year. We also had three propositions on the ballot. <laughs> um, Proposition 482, which was our home rule alternative expenditure limitation passed. Proposition 483 and 484 uh, failed. Those were for the term changes. And other than that, if you have any questions, just ask for your... I, I do have a question. Um, we're going to look at something other than home rule, correct? Yes, but... Um, I, I I understand that, but since we have home rule up here, it, yeah, it is, no, it's, I can speak to it now. No, that's not what I was getting at. I was just going to no. say it's it's too early for us to do it. But what I'm looking at is one of the other options is a permanent base adjustment. Um, so, and my understanding is even with a permanent base adjustment, the cities and towns that have gone with that can go back later to the voters if if they're pushing up against that permanent base adjustment. Perfect. To me, it makes sense for us to do a permanent base adjustment. When can we start doing that? <laughs> um, well, we're gonna we're gonna wait. Um, we need to stabilize a little bit more. I mean, for instance, we know we have some other expenditures coming up, and so we need to kind of stabilize what we're doing with the general fund before we do that. But I would say probably within the next couple of years that we will start planning for that. Okay. It may. I'm thinking realistically, and just being honest here, I'm I'm thinking it's four to six years out is to do the permanent base adjustment so don't we have to do this every four years yes it so would be nice four to, do that. four to eight years is better than okay it would be nice to do it before home rule com comes back on the agenda again, or back on the ballot okay again. well um again part of it is trying to uh, make sure that our estimates are as good as they can be based on some of the things we've had in the past with the utilities and impacts on the general fund so good question though any other questions? Teresa, did you say December 2nd they're going to get sworn in? That first Monday. Is that a second? It, I believe so. If not, I will double check the calendar. But the first Monday in December, they'll get sworn in. Whatever date that is. I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. Uh, it certainly is. is. Seeing no further questions, <laughs> uh, there's so public comment. Yes, on we do have a speaker. Bill <laughs> Bernie has Mr. Besor, welcome. No, I just want to make the motion. Oh, well, no. you do. Well, you have to wait. Go ahead. Let's go. No, no. It's... Good evening. My name is Bill Besor. I'm a resident of Cave Creek. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of the council. I've noticed that we have a flow chart that shows that the citizens are at the top of this thing. And, and so we're supposed to be the boss and it seems like the boss is not very good at acknowledging your hard work. So I'm going to try and touch on that just a little bit. I want to actually begin by thanking Jim Grubb, Alex Nadison and Julie Goldhammer for throwing their hat in the ring. And as it turns out, they get another bite at the apple in two years, and I do hope that they will stay engaged with the town. To the successful incumbents, you know, I spent a lot of time in school taking classes. My teachers had a special term for people like you as slow learners. <laughs> I actually prefer incredibly dedicated. You have done tremendous things. And since we've settled on your comp your your compensation as being nothing better than a few kind words, uh, which is a pretty good deal for us if you think about it. 
Uh, I, I think you need to also take compensation in the incredible things that you've accomplished, the fire department, the, the Phoenix Interconnect, uh, the fact that the town is solvent at this point is, is not a small achievement. And uh, so, Tom, thank you. Tom Ogerton, Tom McGuire, thank you. Bob Morris, thank you. Catherine Royer, thank you. Ernie Bunch, thank you. Dusty, thank you. Now, we've got two two council members. Paul Elkema. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I was looking at this screen. We've got two. Yeah, Paul Elkema, I wanted, I'm addressing you next specifically, so you know you're in trouble. So, <laughs> Paul, thank you for your service here. You have uh, contributed everything, and in particular, we have some plaques that say thank you to many of our landmarks in the same way I'm trying to th say thanks to you. So, Paul, good work, job well done. And I, I understand why you're not doing this anymore. Ernie, brother, if it weren't for you, we would not have a rodeo today. And I think you can take singular credit for that. And I, I appreciate that. And I think the town appreciates that. And that is just one of many things that you have done to contribute. So thank you very much. Then we've got a couple new folks coming on board. And I wanna thank them for running and all the trouble and effort and uh, th that this man still has knuckles is amazing after knocking on that many doors. <laughs> and it takes that, that kind of effort. Uh, so I think I'm get under three minutes here, which is good. I wanna thank everybody for their continued service to this town. You know, we are a small town in competition with two monsters with Scottsdale and Phoenix, and it takes the best team we can put forward. And you guys have done a terrific job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the only uh, comment? So are you on the next time, Bill? <laughs> no additional speakers. Ernie, you want to make that motion? I certainly do. And a comment is going to pre pre precede that. December 1st is my 70th birthday. Okay. December 2nd, you people will get me out of here completely. And I just love it. So, without further ado, motion to approve resolution R twenty twenty four dash eleven, a resolution to the mayor and the town council of the town of Cave Creek, Maricopa County, Arizona, setting forth the official returns and approving the official canvas of the primary election held on July thirtieth, twenty twenty four. Second. Okay, you had the motion, Ernie. So you have the first comment. It, you know, it's been a uh, it, it's a while before I can make a real speech, but it's been a it's been a real uh, pleasure serving this community, and uh, we'll continue to do for do so for another couple of months. But uh, I'm I'm glad that the people uh, of the town, in my opinion, put together another good council. I've I've served on some good ones, and I've served on some weird ones, but this is this should be a good one. You had the second, Dusty. Uh, so I want to kind of echo what uh, what Bill was was saying. Um, there was a lot of stuff out there on social media, and uh, I found it quite amusing uh, because uh, all of us who sit up here uh, have been pretty cordial to each other. Um, we may have some <laughs> policy differences, but quite honestly, I don't think anybody's made it personal. And uh, the, the one thing you need to remember when you're doing these things is it's okay to get passionate separate the passion from what the what the problem is or what the objective is and let's let's work together to you know to move forward but i do think that uh, i got great entertainment value of some of the things that were posted on on social media um to the to the point where i was laughing in tears a couple of times just like give you one example i'm not from california i'm from texas i went to texas a m university but I found it rather amusing and it came up time and time and time again. But I do think that a lot of times what you see, um, we are actually very cordial to each other and, and uh, we listen to each other and uh, we do have some policy differences, but by and large, we all get along. And I, I think that's a kind of a tribute to the professionalism of, of everybody that was elected. And oh. welcome to the, the two new folks. Uh, Enjoy your free time now. <laughs> Paul, did you want to make a comment? I'll recognize you. I did. I, I do, Bob. Thank you very much. 
And I'd like to just congratulate each one of you for running uh, for a seat on this council. It's a real privilege to get to do this work. Um, and it's great work that you do for a very special place. Um, this little town is spectacular. So I honor that work. I thank you for it. And I thank you for running a thoughtful race. It is much appreciated. Thanks. Other comments from council? Daryl. Well, it was the night he said paddy wagon. So I want to remind the council of that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm still mad about that. <laughs> I would just like to say um, how much I appreciate the confidence that our community has in me and the rest of us who got elected. I think that we have proven over the last several years uh, that we care deeply about this community and want only the best for it. Um, and I think it showed, um, at least I tried very hard, just to state my own positions on issues and not denigrate anybody else for what they might believe. I think that's the success and the secret to, to a successful campaign, which is to talk about what's important to you and how you will achieve it and what you already brought to the table, uh, because that is the mark of a dedicated public servant, and that is what I have always attempted to be. So thank you to everybody in this room and anybody watching. Um, and I, I appreciate the vote of confidence once again. Well, I'd like to add my congratulations to the individuals who were elected and who worked so hard. I'd also like to compliment those unsuccessful candidates. It wasn't by much, but they put a lot of effort in. And it really is a tribute to the community that we're able to field uh, such a talented group of people to, to who have interest in, in making the town uh, uh, run the way we'd like it to run. So uh, I do compliment them and hope they'll try again. Uh, with that, um, I guess we are ready for a vote. Uh, voice vote, okay, Mr. Attorney? Yes, sir, not financial. Okay. All those in favor of this, uh, let's see, all, also those in favor of this uh, motion to canvas the primary election, signify by saying aye. 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 Say no. The ayes have it, 7-0. Next item on the agenda is council discussion, possible appointment of resident uh, to the utilities advisory committee. Um, is this being presented or are we just ready to uh, move with the motion? So mayor and council, when the, the council appointed the um, members of the utility advisory, excuse me, utilities advisory committee, um, there was a um, application that should have been in the packet. We don't know how it was not part of it. And we do apologize. Um, he was actually, uh, he was actually recruited Mr. Anderson to, um, serve. And so we do apologize. Um, so that's why we are before you tonight is to, um, have you give due consideration to him. He would have been, um, you know, appointed had he been in the group that the council considered the last time, because the council went ahead by acclamation, everybody that had applied, they appointed. So we're just uh, wishing for you to uh, possibly give the same due consideration to this applicant. Okay. Bob, did you want to say anything? First of all, I want to thank you for considering me, leaving the door open you know, so you can review my application at this point in time. I do appreciate that. And uh, I just can't say enough about how I love the town but its future is water. And that's why I want to volunteer for this committee. I feel it's very important and I want to lend whatever skills and energy I have towards this process to help you and help you in navigating this uncertain future. So with that, ask for your uh, uh, acceptance by volunteering to this committee. Any questions from council? A Thank comment. You. Oh, Paul, go ahead. And the comment is, is that, uh, it's important to notice that Bob's a former member of the Planning Commission. He's a community leader. He's an experienced business professional. And he's a guy who pays attention to details. It couldn't be a better fit. Okay, okay very good. Um, I will make this motion. If I can find it. Uh, oh, here we are. A motion to appoint uh, Robert Anderson to the Utilities Advisory Committee for a two-year term. 
Second. Is there any comment? Okay, the voice vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Welcome, Bob. Sorry for, you, the, Bob. sorry for the misstate, misstep there. Council discussion approval of ordinance uh, 2024-04, an ordinance of the mayor and council of the town of Cave Creek, Arizona, amending the town of Cave Creek town code, title three, administration, chapter 37, revenue and finance, section 37.01, applicability of provisions, declaring an emergency, and retroactively applicable to past cooperative purchases presented by the finance director. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So the request that we have before you tonight is to add um, to the town code to be able to purchase from cooperatives other than what's within the state of Arizona. This is very common um, with other municipalities. The language that we used, um, we basically um, took um, pretty much word for word what the city of Chandler um, uses in their language. That was the one that we had looked at. And um, so this includes uh, an emergency provision in order for this to be effective immediately, um, in order to incorporate some of those past um, procurements that had been done, because um, as was mentioned, this is very common. And so I believe staff had overlooked that in the past, um, expecting that that's what the, it was like every other uh, municipality. So in order to be able to do that, plus we are expecting um, a procurement um, we're hoping to be able to bring that to you at the next council meeting and without the emergency provision, we would, um, knowing that this is now the change that needs to be made to the code to be able to use this out, uh, cooperative outside of the state of Arizona, um, we would need to be able to do that. So I mentioned in the report about how there's a water tender truck that we're looking at that would actually be a very good deal, um, to be able to buy it off of this other cooperative. So, that's that's why we're asking to be able to do this. Um, I have some questions. This is written so broadly that I have no idea what the standards of Native American Indian nations are or any other state. Um, of in, uh, It's just so broad. I'm having real heartburn with this. I, I have no problem with the state that I know what the standards are, even though I'm um, somewhat critical of a lot of the policies of purchasing and, and projects in this state. But I'm reluctant to just throw it wide open like this. So part of what this says is that the competitive purchasing procedures need to be comparable to those required by the town. So we would need to vet the cooperatives to make sure that they meet that standard in order to know whether or not we should join those cooperatives. Uh, um, Mr. Mayor, could I jump in? Th yeah. This arose because a contract came across my desk. It was relying on cooperative purchase, which many governments are doing now to save the time and money. Mm -hmm. Your code only allowed the cooperative purchase for the reasons you just described for internal to the state, Chandler, Peoria. Technically, under Title 11, you can do it under any public agency, and that's the definition here. But the operative word is just, just empowers you. It doesn't require you. Your staff will be the one looking at the contract and to see if it's worthwhile, and you too will be looking at the contract. And based on staff recommendation, you can refuse to approve it. All this does is it corrects an error. Many Your, your, your code didn't allow outside the state. That's what this does. If you'd prefer that we change that definition of public agency is right out of Title 11. If you want us to change it, we can, because I doubt there are very many Native American tribe contracts we would purchase off of. Um, but all this does is it gives you the power. It doesn't give you the requirement, but it's entirely your call. So can you give us an example where it might be more cost beneficial to use something outside the state? Yeah, you find you... Uh, was you showing, yeah, you, you you have a vendor outside the state that is far more that does something that nobody in the state does, and you got to make sure that that vendor was procured under a, under a set of policies like we have. 
because there there are some cases i just did a deal with globe we, we had a vendor there were no you couldn't buy it in the state and so what they did was they found another government outside the state in houston that had done a procurement otherwise they you you would have to otherwise you'd have to do an rfp or probably an rfp or or a bid and you would send it to the houston and send it around the nation and right now we have in that case houston had already done the procurement and so they relied on procurement but you don't your protection is it's only if you believe it's comparable and then if you don't like it you just say no what how do we say no to you don't approve the contract but there are a lot of things that are being procured that don't rise to the council level well then you've already got that yeah. problem I, mean, I can't help you there i mean that's what your code says it, that would be the man that's where we depend on good staff yeah. so um if i may jump in on this so i'll give you an example this tender we're talking about without getting into the specifics on the vendor name or the amount that we're talking about um there is no distributor of that particular um, tender in this state. By going directly through a cooperative purchasing agreement that's based out of state, we're going directly to the um, manufacturer, skipping the distributor or a dealer. And so there's not the markup that you would typically experience. So we're saving our taxpayers considerable money by doing it that way. Um, you'll be seeing that at the next council meeting. So I don't think we're going to see this all the time, but I think you might see it on certain things. Like as an example, um, you might see it on software. You might see it on, um, subscriptions or things like that, that are like software based or web based where for some reason the state doesn't have, there's not a cooperative purchasing, um, arrangement in state that's going to actually be as desirable. We're still paying sales tax on this tender to our state. So it's not like the state we would be acquiring it. In this case, it is what Georgia is. We're, we're paying Arizona licensing fees and also the, the sales tax. So it all comes back to benefit our state and ourselves. So I don't think this is going to be one. There's a lot of these like the Mojave which is originally was set up as a school cooperative purchasing agreement. Almost every city and town and county and the state government belong to that. There's also state contract. We're not saying that these will replace what we currently use, but on the a rare occasion that we find a deal that's much better than what we can do in state, we're going to seek it out. And, and that's, I, I think the bottom line is, is it saves taxpayer money. I think if it's a legitimate procurement policy or action, then I don't know why we would have any issue with it. If other cities in Arizona follow this option, then I don't know why we shouldn't take advantage of it. And, and to be honest with you, what the reason why this is on as an emergency basis is we found that we took advantage of some of these in the past to save money. And so we're trying to correct past um, issues that became, you know, we became aware of but also this current purchase that we're also trying to make. So. Okay. Other questions? Yo, you're getting <laughs> Yeah, I actually, so, so basically this is a, um, by doing this, we're, we're possibly streamlining the process and broad broadening the um, uh, places we can get stuff from and competition is good for pricing. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. If, if I could also just add, across the country, RFP procedures are very, very similar. Uh, there's not a lot of variation in how governments do do RFP processes. So we can evaluate that, but I don't see that we would think that there was a material difference uh, between those. Okay. Any other questions? There's public comment. I have no one wishing to speak. Okay. We're looking for a motion. I'll make the motion. Okay. Motion to approve ordinance zero, no, O oh, two zero two four dash O four, an ordinance of the mayor and council of the town of Cape Creek, Arizona, amending the town of Cape Creek town code title three administration, chapter 37 revenue and finance, section 37.01, applicability of provisions. 
declaring an emergency and retroactively applicable to past cooperative purchases. Uh, okay. You have the, I think you. it's logical and helps us save money yep. uh, in the long run. It's good procedure. It's good to have a staff that can bring the best opportunities to us and yet maintain the kind of responsibility that this council has. Paul, do you have a comment? No, it sounds like a good thing. Others? Do you have access to GSA through this? Because GSA sometimes has the best pricing. Yes, that would be an option. Okay. It wouldn't have been an option under the current code. Yeah, that's why this came No, I get it. But I mean, GSA, when they, they do things like that, you can get stuff for, you know, sometimes two thirds of the price you can get anywhere. I've else. seen that on both vehicles and also yeah. um, IT equipment and software. Specifically, IT equipment. Um, is this considered financial, Bill? Okay, there's a voice vote. All those uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 7 0. Uh, item number four is uh, council's discussion approval to award a contract for phase two tally ho and tandem local drainage mitigation project to Gonzales Asphalt for an amount up to $375,737 presented by the town engineer, public works director. Good evening again, mayor and council. So we're back to talk about phase two of the of drainage mitigation project. If you'll remember last month, we did the award of Tally Ho. Uh, and then if, if you could put the next slide up, please. Uh, Tally Ho was the bottom one. T Tandem is the top one that we're going to be uh, talking about this evening. Uh, next slide, please. So we did a Again, two bids were received, same two bids you looked at last time. Um, and we're recommending the award of the Tandem Drive base bid of $375,737 to Gonzalez Asphalt. And it includes a water project that was not originally considered as part of the scope, which amounted to $107,448 of that uh, 375. Next slide, please. So the potential impact on our other public works project, uh, you asked us to review that. Uh, Tallyho and Tandem were budgeted for 260,000. The total of the two projects um, as awarded or will be awarded is 772,601 uh, with 187,908 being the waterline repair and replacements that were not part of the original budget and amount. That leaves uh, 584693 as the amount for the Tally Ho and Tandem Street drainage improvements. Tally Ho and Tandem drives are 324693 more than budgeted. So next slide, please. So what we did is we looked at the general fund projects, um, and those are listed out of our budget, out of the budget book in order of priority. Um, which includes the um, Tally Ho and Tandem as the first roadway project in priority, and the last being Morningstar and 54th Street uh, chip seal and drainage improvements. And so what we're planning on doing is going down through the list. Um, when we run out of money, we run out of money, um, but we're not going to exceed uh, the budgeted amounts. We also have a HERF funded project that we've identified of 32nd Street Mill and Pave. So depending on whether we can save money, whether all the projects can go forward or not, we will be able to evaluate as the year goes on. With that way, we've already prioritized them in the budget book and that's the priority that we have. So with that, um, are there any questions on uh, the question about the award? No, Morningstar and 54th Street, <clears throat> Those were things that the residents had asked for. The, th the other things I think should have priority are those. And if we have to push Morningstar and 54th Street to next year, I don't think that's a problem. Correct. It's low on the priority list. If we don't have and the that, money. That we... covers most of 
that. So if we can save some money here and there, you can probably get all this stuff done. Also, the schoolhouse microsurface project that you see, that's the right. portion of the schoolhouse that's south of um, Cave Creek Road, which is now being, uh, it's part of an improvement project for the uh, Focus on the Family project. Right. So it may go away. And uh, the uh, 40th Street and Galvin project are dependent upon uh, getting um, approval from state land. Yeah, so there's money there. We're probably going to be able to do everything we need to do, correct? Correct. I mean, I, I think it's time for both Tandem and Tally Ho. What I find egregious, though, is the contractor pricing uh, to do a quarter of a mile of paving for that amount of money. I, I get it. It's on a slope. They have to do the drainage and the other things, but I still find it egregious. Yes, it's the curb gutter sidewalk or curb gutter driveways, not sidewalks, driveways. I, I get it. And I also get the fact that everybody encroached on it over a series of years. But this something this is something that should have been done a while ago. Agreed. I have a question. So Sir. you said um, that the budget was 260000 for both and that now that you budgeted for and that now it's three hundred and seventy five. I think. The design. Did you, under, did you under budget? We under budgeted, but also uh, we budgeted before the design, before we when we before we sent it out for design, and when it came back from design, um, it changed three times during design. Uh, they ran into some um, obstacles such as the cross slope of the road and trying to keep it under six percent, uh, the driveways trying to keep them under twelve to eighteen percent. Uh, that would connect into it. So there were some other factors that fa uh, that came into it that uh, uh, caused them. So we just can't go over and lay pavement over the existing road. The road has to be reshaped quite a bit. The lesson learned is if we ever do, thing, uh, do things on slopes, we need to get the contractor to pay for them rather than us having to pay after the fact. Correct. So, Hal, were these things, these are roads that were done before Cave Creek was incorporated and part of, part of the county, correct? Yeah, uh, Yes, they're uh, roads that uh, existed and were put into place around 1959. So quite a while before Cave Creek existed and um, before when it was a county subdivision. We would probably not have, uh, we were probably required a little bit more curve in the road to take some of the slope out, not just go straight up that slope. So do you think this is going to solve the issues that are prevalent up there? We believe so. It's going to take the drainage and where right now it's coming down and hitting sunset. It's now going to follow along the curb. It's going to sheet off the road. Uh, we're still going to have a sediment issue that we're going to have to deal with uh, to clean up because uh, Black Mountain is still going to contribute sediment, but it will at least be in a uh, concrete uh, pan and taken down to the bottom. Other questions? Okay, uh, there is public comment on this. No one wishing to speak. Okay, so we're ready for a motion. I'll make it. <clears throat> motion to award a contract for the phase two tally ho and tandem local drainage mitigation project to Gonzalez Asphalt for an amount up to $375,737. Second. You have the motion, Dusty? No, I I think this is necessary. And I think it'll also uh, not only help the neighborhood, it'll also help with some of the drainage and some of the sediment that get, kind of flows across the roadways. So this is something that's probably long overdue. Um, it's unfortunate that it's taken so long. It's unfortunate that uh, Maricopa mm -hmm. County does that. But one of the things that I think we're Because of the footprint of our water and sewer company, we're also going to have to take a look at at uh, working with Maricopa County um, potentially on on uh, some things that will happen over on the other side too. Not not on yours, but eventually we'll have to build roadways back up into the state land trust land when it starts to get developed. So we probably ought to start taking a look at those issues now. Well stated, Council Person Roads. Other comments. Seeing none, this is financials. Uh, so we'll have a roll call. Councilmember Augerton? Aye. Councilmember Bunch? Yes. 
Council Member Elkma? Yes. Council Member McGuire? Yes. Council Member Rhodes? Aye. Vice Member Royer? Yes. Mayor Morris? Aye. Motion passes. Oh, did we get Paul? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I missed him. I thought he was asleep. <laughs> Nay, he's not asleep. I can see that now. <laughs> Council discussion and approval on the next item. Council discussion approval authorizing a cooperative agreement with Bastel Cox Industries to install a new duct bank, provide power and network connections between the existing water ranch electrical building and the new town office areas in the Foothills Food Bank building for an amount up to $111,300 presented by the utilities director. Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Oh, hold on a second, Sean. Um, it's been brought to my attention that um, the consent agenda, we had one item that was on there that was financial in nature. It's the second item having to do with the contract for our audit. And normally we would have had a meeting for you and I to go over that to let you know that you need to have a roll call vote on the consent tonight. So yeah, we'll, we apologize. We'll after we finish yeah, this I just yeah. want to let you know about Thank that. You. Yeah. Mayor and Council. Um, so, uh, we start off talking about what you're seeing today is a picture actually of the building space that uh, is part of the land lease that we have with the um, Foothills Food Bank. Uh, the town is getting a 3,200 square foot um, space at our water ranch to actually help house some of our staff. It's actually a, a project but uh, jointly that uh, Hal Merritt and myself are looking at because both of our staffs are going to be living in this space. So this is actually the picture as of last uh, Thursday of the, the area of the 3,200 square feet. So it's going moving fast. So um, the building will house water distribution staff, uh, public work staff, field staff, as well as the uh, wastewater treatment plant staff. We're actually moving them out of the double wide trailer. They'll get a new um, um, uh, office space area. So they're going to get uh, laboratories going to move down and lunch training, conference area and locker rooms. Uh, a lot, all this is uh, largely what we don't have currently. The laboratory is actually shared uh, common space with the uh, staff, not the best opportunity. Um, best thing to have. Uh, so the town is actually, um, uh, what we're getting is a gray uh, shell space from the food bank, effectively the walls, the ceiling, uh, windows, et cetera. Uh, but there's no power electrical or communications to that. So that's actually our responsibility. What you're seeing on the side of the screen is actually a representation of our furniture plans. We've been working with the architect to uh, design the tenant improvements for this space, as well as a furniture vendor for off state contracts to actually come up with a furniture plan. So this is modular furniture is what we've laid out currently. Space. So, um, the food bank is actually bringing their own new electrical service to the building, um, to their side of the building. Uh, when we did research on it, we realized that the original water ranch uh, had design actually had two administrative offices. There was actually an administrative office and a maintenance office. So there actually was electrical power um, capacity at the site in the electrical room to power two uh, auxiliary buildings. And actually the electrical components were set up such that we actually have an emergency generator that backs up the, the plant that actually will support this additional load. So instead of us um, doing what the food bank did, which is actually bringing in a new electrical service from APS, and then we'd have to look at um, a generator backup for this space, we thought the best use of the staff or the town's resources was actually to do a duct bank that would connect this building space independent of the food bank uh, to the town's um, water treatment plant, the electrical room. And that's where you're seeing the representative, the red line there is actually the duct bank path in general. Uh, with that, we'll bring electrical power down. Um, and then as part of this scope of work, uh, Bessel Cock will bring a duct bank down and actually bring the conductor to allow it to be terminated at either end. And then we're going to uh, include additional conduits to allow for uh, future connectivity. Um, we'll do a fiber optic link between the plants. This the, the control room for the plants is actually going to be in the new building space. So we'll have a fiber optic link back to the building. We're doing, some, as we pass by the uh, water fill station, we're actually going to do some improvements to that to inc uh, improve the power and the network connectivity down to the existing water fill station, allow for also for future connection for a, an automated gate that doesn't exist on the plant. So uh, we're doing a lot. Um, the generator itself, we'd estimated if we'd had to have emergency generator for this building for the size of load, it's about $100,000. The um, food bank is actually going to bring their generator in and it's going to be uh, putting a generator for the building. But we already have our generator at the site. So instead of having a second meter and a separate generator, we're going to be tied off the existing plant generator and equipment. Um, so that's really the huge advantage of this. Uh, and we'll uh, add extra connectivity to this. The uh, project currently shows up in the capital program as three funding sources. There's $300,000 in Cape Creek water, $300,000 in Cape Creek wastewater, and then uh, 
$200,000 in the general CIP. So there's $800,000 of funding identified towards us doing the uh, this this being one of the scopes to work for the project. So uh, right now, the next phase of this, once this is released, this will allow us to get the duct bank in. Um, we're working with our design team to wrap up the design and we'll come back to council at a later date with a, um, a construction manager or a not a construction manager, but a, a, um, a bid. Uh, once the design is complete, we'll actually hard bid the, the tenant improvement of the interior space and the mechanical equipment inside the space, not be coming back as a separate contract for uh, to council to award. What we're asking tonight is to get the contract with Bestel Cox done. One of the reasons for doing this is by the end of the year before uh, around Christmas time, the food bank actually is going to be doing their grading outside the building. So we're we have a short window to get this work done, get the duct bank at least clear from the building. Although the contractor will probably just continue all the way up to uh, complete the, the, uh, the duct bank. But we want to be clear of the improvements that the food bank are going to complete by the end of the year, which is the paving on the east side of the building. They're going to pave everything, including uh, our area over there. So with that, I can answer any questions, but we're asking for having authority to uh, use a cooperative purchase agreement with the existing contract. One of the reasons we uh, went with Bestel Cox is actually we reached out to the original project team that was working on the food bank building. We actually asked them to give us an estimate for doing this work. We've assumed they were down there. Their estimate came out actually a little bit higher. And Bestel Cox actually has done work on the site. So since uh, we're um, tying into existing circuits, tying into the existing network, uh, we like to work with a firm that um, uh, we've had familiarity with, and we did find an existing contract. That's why we're doing a cooperative purchasing agreement off an existing contract that they have for this type of work. So with that, I can answer any questions for council. Questions? Seeing none, we have public comment. I have no one wishing to speak. Okay, then we are ready for a motion. Ernie? Yep. Okay. Um, authorize a co cooperative purchase agreement with Bastel Cox Industries to install a new duct bank to provide power and network connections between the existing Water Ranch Electrical Building and the new town office area in the Foothills Food Bank Building for an amount not to exceed one hundred eleven thousand three hundred dollars. Second. Okay. Yeah. The uh, motion. Yeah. You know we got to get the power over there. It makes you know we can't do it with candles i think it's our pleasure to work with the food bank they've done wonderful service to the community not only cave creek the extended community so working with them is a, a credit to the town i just think Most it's right. wonderful that our own employees will have clean decent working quarters uh, because they deserve it and i'm glad that this is happening when will it be done we understand the food bank, uh, they expect to be done in, in the spring uh, because we're a little behind with getting our design done. We expect um, to either be done uh, next summer or late next summer. With, so we build, move our staff in. That's really great. Paul, did you want to jump in? Nope. I think this just sounds great. Um, it's really important for um, that staff um, to, to have access and to be in a good workspace. Really appreciate it. Other comments? Seeing none, we're ready for a roll call on this, please. Councilmember Augerton? Aye. Councilmember Bunch? Yes. Councilmember Alkmont? Yes. Councilmember McGuire? Yes. Councilmember Rhodes? Aye. Vice Mayor Royer? Yes. Mayor Morris? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We're going to go back to um, the consent agenda item A2. Council approval to enter into a contract with Howard Auditing Group LLC for sales tax auditing services for fiscal year 2024-25 through fiscal year 2026-27 for an amount up to $24,000 per year. Uh, I move that this be approved. Second. Have a roll call, please. Councilmember Augerton? Aye. Councilmember Bunch? Yes. Councilmember Alkma? Yes. Councilmember McGuire? Yes. Councilmember Rhodes? Vice Mayor Royer? Yes. Mayor Morris? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Uh, we are on to the uh, department's report presentation of the quarterly fire and emergency medical report. And I saw Brian Tobin sneak in the room. Brian, welcome.
Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, members of the community and staff. This is the uh, fourth quarter report for fiscal year 23-24. Um, in, in your packet is the complete written report. And then I've put together a little PowerPoint here that we can go through quickly and review some of the numbers and some of the accomplishments that occurred this last quarter. Um, so with that, I do have uh, Chief Tobin with me today. He comes to make sure that I don't screw this up too bad. <laughs> so, but um, so we'll just, uh, if there's not any questions to start, we'll just head through this pretty quick if that's okay with you. Um, again, this is for fiscal year 23-24. Um, what you see there is April, May, and June for the quarter, the total number of calls that we had, 223 for the year. Um, town, in, town incidents with 780 total incidents. It's broken down by EMS, fire, service calls, which is snakes and assistance, community assistance, and then special ops, which is primarily made up of gas leaks and uh, trail rescues. Those types of things are considered special operations ones. Um, you can see the number of uh, incidents we had. You can see the number of times we had assistance from the region. Um, you'll notice that in May, it's a very large number. We went up to 358, and that was because May, as you recall, we'll talk about it a little bit, um, we had several major incidents. And when we have those major incidents, then we get all the assistance that we need from the region, we had those those brush fires and those types of things. So we track the number of uh, regional units that helps us. Uh, the training underneath that is uh, year to date as part of our IGA and agreement with Daisy Mountain. Um, they're required to train to the national standards. And so you can see, that, again, the different categories that we have for training there with the driver operator company training officer training. Those numbers will adjust by month and by quarter, depending on what's the focus of that quarter. And if you recall, at the uh, beginning of the year, the, the calendar year, um, you were in one of your packets. The council packet was the annual training report from Daisy Mountain with uh, what they were going to focus on and, and where we were going to go with that. The next slide is just the comparison of the uh, the fourth quarter incidents and then our year to date incidents. And so you can kind of see that we run pretty much just about 75% of our calls are emergency medical calls. And those are made up of everything you can imagine, heart attacks, strokes, car accidents, um, falls. Falls are a big, um, a big number for us. We have a lot of falls in this community more than I was used to in my previous ones. But so that might be something that we talk about down the road is, is some uh, community outreach. But you can see those are the the um, kind of comparisons that we we've gone on for the year and for the quarter. The next slide is um, I just put this up because it was a calendar year or, or fiscal year. So it gives you three full years of comparisons of of numbers in the different categories. And again, you're 74, 75 percent for medical calls calendar years versus fiscal years, you'll get a, another one of these at the end of the calendar year, so you can show three calendar years comparing to each other, because the numbers do change a little bit, but the con the percentages pretty much will stay the same. But you can see as uh, people are getting used to us having us out here, we're going on a few more calls, and as the community continues to grow. So we started out at the 630, we're up to 780 incidents. And um, I want to make a quick statement, because I've been talking to a lot of people in the community, and uh, I haven't run this by the chief yet, but um, people are saying we don't want to bother the fire folks, so we're not calling. And that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why these resources are here. Um, if it's an emergency for you, it's we're there to help. And these the folks, the Daisy Mountain fire folks and our, our resources are here to help. So we would much rather you call early and have us get there and say, this is fine. You might have twisted your ankle or it's not a fire and then be able to go back as opposed to not make that call and then have that turn into a major incident or a much larger incident. So uh, just a little editorial comment on my part, because I've heard that quite a bit from members of the community lately. So if you need us, call us. That's why we're here. And we're here 24-7. Chief, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I can't reiterate the importance of calling when you need us and calling us soon. The sooner, the better so that we can get there and resolve uh, whatever issues you might be having so that it doesn't get worse. So, and there's some public relations that we might be able to do on that and share some just um, um, information to the public about when to call and, and how to call, that would be helpful. And then so next in the slideshow and in your packet is some uh, 
just identifying some of the um, noteworthy activities that occurred in this quarter. Um, again, the station is coming along very, very well. Um, the bike week was was very well. We didn't have any major incidents during bike week. Working with the opioid settlement money, and we're going to get some uh, some grant money back out to our local nonprofits. We're going to get some of that money back to the school district. I'm working with them, and to um, the caring corps. And so that's where we're going to that money is going to run through us back to them, the grant money, and that's kind of been approved that we can use it for those reasons. So we're we're working on that right now. Um, we attended the open house that uh, Chief Tobin is is uh, designing a new station. The new station is going to go at 24th and Cloud, 144th Street. So they had an open house over there for the community, very well attended. I thought it went very well. Um, I was invited to speak at the Wyoming Chiefs Association in reference to community risk reduction. I've been doing that for a few years, and they finally got me to Wyoming. That was a long drive. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that again. <laughs> um, in May, um, Important that we're as part of the region, Daisy Mountain hosted a tabletop with the Tonto Forest and Arizona Department of Emergency Management to talk about wildland fires. It was May 1st is when they held the tabletop and to talk specifically about what are we going to do if we have a fire in this area? How do you call the resources? Make sure that everybody's communications are together. And then right after that, um, we had the May 6th brush fires. Um, well, you had the two large town brush fires on off of schoolhouse and then off of Fifty uh, Second Street. So, um, I think that that got everybody's attention a little bit. Just so you know, we will be coming back to you with the uh, manager and the attorney to upgrade our fire uh, code, our fire ordinance. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to um, have our fire season actually start on May first, no matter what the the um, the weather is, and then we'll we'll raise the the level after that, but we'll start on May 1st every year because it seems to be happening in May. We're having those types of incidents. Um, we did increase the brush hazard staffing early. We put that up on May 6th due to the conditions that were out there. Usually we wait till the holiday, but we'd put it up on May 6th. And then uh, Rancho Manana was officially recognized by the state and the NFPA as a wildland uh, nationally certified firewise community. Um, then we went through the budget process, which was was uh, probably as much fun for you all as it was for everybody else, but it was a very good process and we appreciate it. And then uh, just a couple of quick things, other professional recognitions. I was uh, inducted into the Scottsdale History Hall of Fame in May, um, which was quite an honor for me and quite a surprise. I tried not to do that, but they, they told me I couldn't give it back. And then in June, Chief, Chief Tobin was recognized by the Arizona Fire Chiefs Association with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, let me put up there he is at the at the state conference. <laughs> he got a, a bell that's way bigger than anything you can use it for. It's huge. <laughs> that is true. Um, but there's a, a second note to that is uh, he was just noticed and it'll be on our next quarterly report. But he was also um, recognized by the state fire training committee, which puts on the state fire school in September. And so the first week of September, he'll be recognized for the um, Scottsdale Arizona Firefighters, or not Scottsdale, the Arizona Firefighters Hall of Fame. So he'll be going on the wall down at the Hall of Flame Museum as a Hall of Fame member for the Arizona Fire Service. So you got hang, you hang around long enough. There's no one else left. <laughs> it's been a good so run for him. Yeah. I'm trying to learn. So, <laughs> so it, it's well-deserved. Well, deserve recognition for Chief Tobin. He's done an awful lot for the fire service in Arizona and, and here in the Valley Thank you, and Jeff. for us. So we appreciate it. And then this is new, and again, we'll come up on the next one, but um, part of our performance measures that we've been working on, um, we did this last year and Daisy Mount did it again this year, recognized by the um, Arizona um, American Heart Association, I'm sorry, Mission Lifeline Gold. This tracks how well they treat and document the EMS calls, emergency medical services calls, and there's standards that you have to meet and you have to uh, um, show them your records and all. Um, this is the first part of that, the Daisy Mountain Fire folks and Fire Department, which is our service folks, obviously, um, are the only ones in Arizona that get the gold. And what's the second part of that, Chief? The uh, heart, uh, there's a heart component of it. Yeah. Um, and so they, they are the only ones in Arizona that have that recognition and they, they maintain that and they will maintain it as part of our performance measures as we go forward. So they just, this was just sent to them after this was printed. So, so we are getting that. 
and then uh, six years in a row, I think. Six years in a row. And then I just wanted to let everybody know we, we are getting a fire truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in spite of everything, um, we went in, in July and took a look at it. That's our truck that you see there in the photos. Um, it was off the uh, assembly line. It was sitting in the, the ready bay um, to get start doing the final testing on it. The one on the right is Chief Tobin's first truck that comes off. If you recall, we bought four trucks, and because we bought four trucks, we got a discount on those vehicles. And so these are the first two that are coming off, and they're going back September 10th to do the final final walkthrough and certification of the vehicles, and we should get them shortly after that and get them here. Um, I'm okay if they wait a little bit. I don't want to put them in the dirt, <laughs> dirt outside. Get them dirt. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they should be coming fairly quickly. And so with that, I'll, Chief, I'll turn it to you if you have any comments about how things are going and oh, any overall comments. Uh, no, uh, only comments I would make. I just want to thank the town for how accommodating they've been to some of the difficult uh, circumstances revolving around the fire station. And our guys are living in a single wide trailer doing the best they can, but they've uh, they're they're getting through it. They see right next to them that there's light at the end of the tunnel, and they know how great the facility is going to be. I walked through it last week myself with one of the contractors to so just get updated on it, and I can just say it's beautiful, and we just want to thank you for that support. It's going to be beautiful for the town, but most of all, it's going to be a good place for my members to work and keep them safe and uh, all the things we're starting to learn with fire station facilities, so we thank you for that as well. And we've mentioned it at the chamber meetings a couple of times and things. We will be doing a, a grand open house for that. Um, the end of November, 1st of December, we'll have, the dates haven't been decided yet, but we'll be looking at that and we'll have an open house and a uh, christening of the fire station. Yes. And the new trucks. So yeah, it should be exciting. You should have your, your class one pumper there, a water tender and your brush truck and your UTV and cut some ribbons and push some trucks in. It'll be great for the town. It'll be, it'll be a great milestone. I just, before I want to, I just want to thank uh, Ernie Bunch for, uh, I know this is, uh, he didn't run for re-election, but certainly was the mayor during the time of all of this and all of you for all your support for Daisy Mountain. And it's just so great to see it all coming together like it has. And thanks to your support for that. Well, I'd like to congratulate both of you for the honors. Uh, and, and I think that the performance of Daisy Mountain in town and has been just exceptional. I, I had a, a bird's eye view of the uh, uh, fire uh, on uh, Schoolhouse and saw that response and again started by a gate and some kind of uh, welding. Uh, and it burned right up to the back doors, but we didn't lose any property. I, I, I honestly believe if we hadn't made that switch when we did uh, there would have been some houses burned down in that fire because it uh, it burned right up to the back door of half a dozen houses um so uh, i i think uh, daisy's just done a marvelous job and really brings high quality it's a pleasure to to meet those guys and gals out once in a while yeah they're great people and i'm them. really yeah. proud of representing them they make my job very easy well, I wouldn't say your job is easy, but <laughs> they do, they do, they do put the fires out and the medical. Yes. Uh, other comments from council? I just want to say that May of 2020 was a major wake up call for this community. And um, I'm happy to have been here in order to respond to that and take care of the issues that we actually had. And we could have again, but not near as possible as it was before. I think it was money well spent. The three brush fires alone in the month of May, we we would have we would have lost houses. Mm -hmm. Mayor Bunch came and visited refugees at the uh, Tumbleweed Inn, which was the housing <laughs> that we were sent to temporarily. That's right. Uh, worked the crowd. Mm -hmm. and I worked him, and then he worked the crowd some more. <laughs> but uh, all the years we've lived here. It really hasn't been an issue up until you remember that Cave Creek complex fire. Oh, I'm sorry. Remember that Cave Creek complex fire years ago? And that really was an attention getter, but it was still kind of in the distance and it didn't have the immediacy. And then the Seven Sisters was really scary because 
you could smell it and you could see it and it was getting brighter when the sun went down mm -hmm. and then there were the ghostly figures of those guys up there probably some of your people mm -hmm. that had the yellow jackets but they have that reflective strip mm -hmm. and you don't see anything except the reflective strip up there with hand tools in 110 degrees at one in the morning and um, we used the parking lot of the library kind of as a refuge place for us then so uh, after you've been a refugee for a couple of times, it's just to get your attention. But um, yeah, I think I think really she'd have a dump tank for Ernie Bunch as a fundraiser <laughs> for the firehouse because some of us would bid on it. And I think we'd get into a competitive bid. Out of the rodeo, <laughs> dump tank's a good idea. <laughs> uh, ever since the big fire, in what year was it? Just, no, the other one we just had two years ago. 2020. 2020. Yeah. 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 Um, 2020. I think of all the things Ernie has done, even even the, the rodeo grounds and the sky suites and everything else out there, mm -hmm. I do think that the thing we'll remember him the most for, besides his accent and his bad jokes, will be the fire department. Uh, because uh, how do you know when a town's big enough to do something beyond what it used to do, which was pretty much nothing, uh, and that was the answer. And and I think the gratitude will be more in the future than it has been so far. But for those of us who have had to chase horses at mm -hmm. release that day, and who would have thought you take white shoe polish and put the phone number of the horse owner on the front of the shoe so when the animals are released during the fire, they know how to find their way mm -hmm. back to their owner. Did you know horses have belly buttons? <laughs> <laughs> because when the propane tanks were exploding, on old stage road the horses would stand up on two feet and pretty much escape all of us who had them with their halters and it's just a passing thought that i had that afternoon amidst all the chaos <laughs> i didn't know horses had belly buttons talk about my joke <laughs> trying to step out of this but anyway but with all seriousness i think i i remember ernie that day and uh uh, I'd seen Ernie for a lot of years up here and he'd been a mayor up here in the dais, but that day out there in the field, you know, in the front of the tumbleweed in trying to offer comfort or attention or some type of information, and you were not treated as well as you could have been by the district command over at the Horizon School, and I'll leave that alone if you'd like, but um, I told Ernie to go down and get a town car and a town staff person and go crash the place. So anyway, I, I just would like to thank Ernie as a resident and survivor of that fire. No comments. Paul, do you want to say anything? No, I think we're just, uh, I, I, I appreciate that effort from Mr. Bunch and I love having the fire department. When those guys walk through the door, I mean, it is help happening. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and thank you for all your hard work putting this together. It wasn't easy putting all this together, the fire department, and uh, uh, there's a lot of credit. Jim Scottsdale uh, uh, trained you up pretty good. You come in here and help us out with it. Well, as the chief said, if you hang around long enough, things happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> you got the so. Okay, seeing no further business, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.